Thank you, Barbara. Thank you. What's up? I'm very, very happy to be here. This is my favorite type conference. Yeah. Okay. So, dumb name for a talk. I'm very sorry about that. But when I was talking to Sasha about it, um, I don't know. We kind of just came up with this idea for a talk, and I sent all the information, named it, checked the website like a few months later, and I was like, oh, that's kind of a stupid name for a talk. And then I realized it was my talk, and I forgot that I had named it this. <laughs> but uh, in any case, here we go. It is something I care about, but we can talk about it. So the story begins in 2014, kind of, for me, and that's when I graduated Type Media and moved back to the Bay Area from Europe because I was super, like, homesick and stuff. Um, but I just graduated type design school, and anyone that goes through that program, um, you're immediately confronted with the reality that there's no jobs in type design, you know? It's not like I'm being headhunted on LinkedIn or anything like that. Um, so I was also kind of disappointed with how type foundries were portraying themselves and the things they were releasing and the way they were showcasing type felt like maybe not as exciting as some of the things that drew me into type design in the first place. Um, so that was kind of all in my mind floating around and what do you do as a graphic designer when you have ideas floating around? You start with a mood board. And uh, I think graphic designers are actually better at making mood boards than like doing graphic design work a lot of times. <laughs> uh, so this is kind of the way that I started, and it was a fun exercise. And it's fun to look back on it now, like much later. Uh, in a little bit of time, I had uh, the first three releases up, and that felt really good just to have like this modest catalog of display fonts and, and sort of carving out a little niche. But then I really realized that I knew nothing about running a business. Um, I had an outsider's perspective on the type industry and not an insider's perspective at all. And I had zero business acumen or marketing skills or anything like that. And then I just kept going that way for like several years. <laughs> uh, and then I had a baby. We had a baby a year ago. Here we are supporting our favorite Canadian type foundry, Coppers and Brasses. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that's, that's Loretta. And I don't know if other parents can relate to this, but like when you have a baby, I was immediately hit with a gut instinct to uh, make money. <laughs> and things were fine. Like we, we weren't in dire straits or anything, but I realized I was running my business kind of like an art practice and just working on the things that I wanted to work on. Um, and really kind of like an unsuccessful art practice because now I look at artists, and, uh, <laughs> artists. Um, artists, and uh, I see them running their art practice like a business, and it, it's very successful for them, you know? So anyways, the time required to make something like Hobo Rococo or, or one of these other silly things is like really significant, and before having a kid, it just meant like, oh, no one wants to buy it, I'll just like go make another one and try it again, you know? Um, but now it meant time away from my baby that I wasn't going to get back. So I had to take a long, hard look in the mirror and kind of think about these two things. Every graphic design practice is some balance of these two things, but it's totally flexible however you want to split it up. And that's really cool, and I like that designers have that ability to decide for themselves what really works. So I had like two choices, essentially. One was to find more people that were interested in the same sorts of stuff that I'm interested in. And then the other choice would be to make things that people already kind of wanted. And I think that's what a lot of people do. Um, but I kind of wanted to meet in the middle, so I just became obsessed with this Venn diagram of like maybe there's something in the middle that I would enjoy working on and then maybe it would find some commercial success and then I would have a chance at sending my daughter to college. <laughs> so that's why in 2019, like the last three things I've been working on have all been sans because I'm kind of like, okay, let's see if there's a way to make like a funky sans or something that I'm kind of interested in but then could maybe work for a corporate brand or something. 
And as you go down the list, of course, it immediately gets more expressive. And then the thing with Hobo Rococo was like, at that time in my life, I was paying like $700 a month in rent, which Bay Area is like very, very reasonable. I had zero responsibilities. Um, I was doing like some casual Tinder dating, but I had like no expenses, you know what I mean? <laughs> and that's a, like if you're a student or any person in that sort of, uh, that sort of situation, like go nuts, because why not? Like to be safe in that situation super sucks to me. Um, so yeah, of course I made a, a revival of Hobo. Um, I had another idea, which was like, what if I just designed like the thing? You know what I mean? Like the, <laughs> and I think, <laughs> so it sounds like a good idea, right? So the way, the amount of money that has been spent on Helvetica since 1955, like just imagine, like that is completely bonkers to me. And it dominated for so long and then Tobias draws Gotham. And then that like takes a sizable chunk out of it, you know? And that's like amazing that that's even possible to do. Like writing a hit song on that level is incredible. And then someone does it again. So I'm thinking about these three typefaces. <laughs> and I'm like, mama mia, what variety, right? So <laughs> this, is, this seems to be what people want. So I was like, what's the default sans of today? And I thought long and hard about this question, and I did a bunch of research, and I read a lot, and I came to this answer. Just kidding, just kidding. <laughs> I think it actually doesn't exist, and I think that's a really good thing. So if you look at the number of type foundries that have existed over the last couple hundred years, because of the internet, and because of education, and because of the type tools are, are getting so good, you're just seeing a spike. And I wanna say that I use no actual data in this graph. <laughs> I just drew two lines, and I got the pen tool, and I went wiggle, 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 and then a spike. <laughs> but I think it's kind of like, I think it's accurate. <laughs> Uh, but I think there's a wealth of awesome stuff out there that needs to be made more visible. So why am I here? I want to show you who I am and like what I'm interested in and to say straight up, I'm available. Like I do custom work. <laughs> I'm not beating around the bush here or like trying to be coy. Um, and I want to also clue you into awesome work that I think is being made uh, from other people in the industry all over the world and we're in the golden age of this stuff. And it's really time to indulge in some of the variety that's out there. A uh, bigger idea is I want to dispel the myth that default sans typography is a good idea. Um, <laughs> all right. First applause bre break in a graphic design lecture. Uh, it sucks joy out of our profession and it leads to bland and forgettable identities. It homogenizes our visual culture, which I think is super dangerous, and it might save time, but at what cost? I've had exactly one viral tweet in my life. There it is. It happened in February of 2018, where I was just trying to put all these points in a Twitter-friendly format, essentially. And um, so I saw that people like were waking up to this, and a lot of people were on board, and there was a lot of discussion too, but whatever. Um, I mean, it's like Twitter, some good, some bad, uh, but we still see a lot of arguments in favor of typographic homogeny. One is this analogy of like the black t-shirt, you know what I mean? Like, oh, everyone needs like a black t-shirt in their wardrobe, like it works in a lot of situations, and it kind of goes with everything, and Helvetica is like a black t-shirt. Um, I definitely think it's sweatpants. It's a clear signal you've given up on life, and <laughs> they work extremely well in limited circumstances, and they're technically like acceptable everywhere. Like you can wear sweatpants to a wedding, but it's not a really chill move. <laughs> I think a better analogy might be uh, 
Jimmy John's selling sandwiches via meme format advertising. So what's going on? They're like exploiting this format to sell sandwiches and they're using an existing social perception of a thing, you know? And I think they're doing that partly because it's like an instant joke, but they're really keeping people from thinking too hard. I'm sure it's effective, it totally works, but it's also really low hanging fruit and in a way it's just like too easy. So using the sands of the day, whatever it is, it's sort of like that to me. You're leveraging the history of these uses uh, in whatever typeface to paint with a false sense of trust. I'm more impressed by stuff like this, another meme. <laughs> this is by Teenage Stepdad. Uh, but this person creates their own memes and like with their own kind of content. I don't know if he drew the monster truck, I kind of doubt it, but like it's a lot of, uh, it's a, a specific aesthetic and, and that's kind of interesting to me. And there's layers of jokes and it's not like necessarily just hitting you over the head with it. I don't agree with all these things. I don't think people should drop out of design school necessarily. Um, and taking drugs, you know, up to you. But I think we should definitely be using more fonts. <laughs> So it's so much better to write your own material, like crafting your own intended perceptions, working with type that's uh, new and fresh and more free of these connotations allows the meaning to be more carefully manipulated by you. And it's more ownable, it's more respectful of the audience, and most importantly, I think it's more fun. And has, <laughs> as anyone that's ever planned like an Airbnb weekend trip knows, Fun can be a lot of work. I think there's two basic steps. You got to make yourself aware of what's out there, and, and that takes a lot of time. And then you have to make the effort to make sure it succeeds, and actually selling the idea to a client, like that's a lot of work. It's a lot of time. And clients are especially hesitant to work with type that's unfamiliar to them, and for good reason. But I believe we can do it, and I have a secret for um, getting the time that's required, creating social media. Uh, I recommend this book. It might make you hate Instagram, which I think is a very uh, good thing. No offense to Teresa and what she's doing there. I'm sure it's sick. Um, but the, uh, the author, Cal Newport, suggests a digital detox. So just like limiting technology use hardcore as much as possible for 30 days just to evaluate where you are with this. And our phones also tell us how much we're using our phone now, you know, like it, it says. My Instagram usage, it got up to like two hours a day. So I cut that out and I got an extra two hours out of my day. Like it did this for 30 days, it was great. And the best thing was like anxiety, kind of base level anxiety came way down. It was so weird. So. The author suggests filling this extra time with what he calls quality leisure time. But I suggest researching sick typefaces. <laughs> a way to do that is the website type.lol. There's a bunch of like Type Foundry index websites, but just imagine if you replaced all Instagram behavior for a short amount of time, 30 days, whatever, with a casual perusal of type foundries and one by one you're kind of taking notes and like bookmarking fun things to use. That would be so rad. You would make type designers so happy. Another great resource to spend some time on is future fonts. Um, as, as Barbara mentioned, I was involved in the beginning of this and like post baby, I'm kind of less involved on it. Uh, but we did a lot of work at the beginning to get a really fantastic group of like amazing type designers that are working on really cool projects, mostly kind of display fonts, but some tech stuff too. And I'm really proud of the group of people that we have over there. Finally, fonts in use. We're all going to fonts in use, right? This is like the best graphic design resource, like period. It's so good. And my favorite thing about it is that you can approach it kind of like 
with your own interests. So this is just a set that has only fonts by women. So if that's something that's important to you when you're shopping for fonts, you can find that stuff. Like it is available and designed to be in a consumable format for you. If you spend a lot of time on Type Foundry websites, you'll see a lot of people talking about variable fonts right now. Like that's kind of the latest technological leap that's been happening. It's super exciting for a lot of reasons that I want to talk about. But first of all, the main thing is like, how stupid is this user interface? I'm working on a Sans family right now, it's 96 styles. And to choose one, you have to sort through a list of 96 things. That's ridiculous. Who has the time to really go through all this stuff? <laughs> so isn't that a more logical way to choose? Like straight up, way more efficient? That's a huge bonus right there, and that's not even talking about the fonts themselves. Uh, I've been passing this around to like my friends and stuff, and the thing that I hear is this feels like graphic design in the future, and I feel so enthusiastic about it. It makes me want to tinker and play, and uh, as one of my friends says, slip sliding all over the place. Uh, I think it's a fun way, and it's a really like instinctual way of messing with type, and that's a really important thing, that it feels like almost tactile when you're dragging sliders around. There's a bunch of other benefits as well that you can have this like automated fit to width thing. Super, super useful. You can put things into animations. Like I'm sure you guys all saw this stuff for the conference already. And Nick Sherman spearheading the uh, graphic design of this conference was of course like a dream for me because he's using these fonts in, in the way that I kind of intended them to be used. Additionally, and this is where it gets really cool to me, um, this is Rob Stenson's work. Rob is many things, but an interface designer for an audio plugin company called Good Hertz, which is doing some really exciting things in interfaces. Having a width axis in a typeface means that you can do translations. This is a different language and a different language, and even though it's a very strict uh, layout, you can do these things relatively easily, and you can program them. Um, talk to Rob, he's at the conference, if you're interested in how he does this stuff, and the hint is that it's not in Adobe software, it's in Drawbot, which is a really cool, and it, it dovetails really nicely with variable fonts. It's not just weight and width, though. You know, you can think of an axis as anything. This is a typeface called Chi that has a temperature axis, a, a yeast axis, <laughs> and a gravity axis. Another um, benefit is that they can just be used like normal fonts. This is Mike Essel's sick book of Mr. T dolls. <laughs> That he's just kind of, he's not animating or anything because it's a book and stuff, but it's still like the fallback is just their normal fonts again. So what's the problem? <laughs> so, so good. So it's 2019, uh, five years later, and I'm still kind of figuring out what this overlap is. Uh, making some things that are actually like useful to designers. That is important to me. But I also want to work on things that are fun, and I think that there should be a balance there, and I hope there's a balance there for you and, and what you do as well. Action items for you, I think I've been pretty clear, but like, let's just break it down. We're gonna quit social media, we're gonna research hella typefaces, <laughs> we're gonna consider the catalog, the rest of the fonts in a Foundry's library when we're deciding where to spend our money. We're going to have a favorite foundry. That's so important to have a foundry. And if you do already, to have a favorite foundry in every country or something like that, a bunch of favorite foundries. You're gonna buy some fonts that you love <laughs> and you're gonna try variable fonts and you're gonna use them on your projects and you're not gonna do it for any other reason than to have fun. So don't follow me on social media. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>